How's it going, everybody? Andy, what's up, my man? Good to see you. Not too, not too much. Reporting in from a North Greenville University, playing at a uh, huge camp here with a, an artist, Micah Christopher, this week. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Micah sang on one of our loop worship songs. That that he did. He's got a great, great voice. Um, that's awesome, man. Well, good to see you. I'm glad that you're uh, able to join us for this Loop Live show. We want to talk about recording and producing music, which you have a bit of experience doing. I, you've produced tons of our premium tracks at Loop Community. You've also produced all, except for one, I think, of our Loop Worship songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those were actually like original songs that we like sent you demos for, like rough scratch vocals, scratch everything, and you like basically produced a full sounding you know track i know you've produced other artists and church albums and so you have a lot of experience in this and so i wanted to kind of pick your brain about it for a little bit yeah thanks so first of all i guess the question would be why why do you think it's even important like why should a church start writing and producing their own music because there's so much music out there right like yeah you've got yeah, Hillsong I mean, and Bethel. It, it, they're they're all doing their thing why should someone it, else do yeah it? It, yeah i mean it, it, with so many songs out there there's still so much cre God created us as creative beings. And so there's, there's an endless well of creativity to worship God with. Yeah. And I think it's super important. Like you, songs can come out that speak to your church, but there's something powerful about writing songs that are welled up from within your church of what's happening in your people. It's really powerful to work and write a song and think, I was thinking about this specific person that we're now leading in worship. Yeah. That when you're writing that song, it's kind of so amazing think, yeah. to think that like when you hear a new song, you're like, wow, how is this, you know, for thousands of years, like no one's written this song, like these lyrics, this melody, you know, sometimes like there's ones that sound like the other ones, like others. Yeah. But it's interesting how like there's always a new melody and a new lyric to find. Oh, 100%. And I think the, especially for the local church that it's so important to write for the people in your church. I think a lot of times people get in their mind, I want to write this huge congregational song when w we are so unique and that our, our experiences are so unique that, but they also can resonate with so many people. So it's almost like if you try to write a song for a thousand people, one person will hear it. If you try to write a song for one person, a thousand people will end up hearing it. There's, there's something about writing for those unique experiences in your church. Oh, that's really interesting. So is that kind of the approach you guys take at your church? Like you basically are taking a sermon series or something, or you're like, like how do you decide no. what to write about for your church? Yeah, so what we've done is we have, we have writing days, and we always invite people. We noticed, we started writing in our church when we realized that we had so many people on our worship team that were just already songwriters anyway. Uh, it wasn't like we, a bunch of people on our team didn't write at all, and we thought, oh, let's get together and try to write worship. We were all writing already, and so we thought, let's just bring this together and do it for our church. And so what we what we usually do is we do a songwriting day, and we we cast we do a little Bible study to start out, cast a little bit of vision, and then we just spend time getting to know each other. It's almost like a small group within our church. It feels like we bring some out, outside writers in as well, but it's it's pretty cool because when you go into those writing sessions, you go into it not thinking, okay like this song's gonna have to be sung on Sunday morning. It's more of like, how can I see the heart of God and sing about the heart of God for the next two hours with these other people? And it's, so it's, it's, it's really cool going into those writing sessions thinking, even if no one ever hears this song besides the people in this room, we still got to talk and sing and worship God together and really dive into his word and try to create something from that. And yeah. that, that has value. That is cool. A couple of things that popped in my head on that. One is that you do have to really be intentional with those days that you're writing songs. Like I think a lot of people are like, I want to write songs. I want to. We want to write songs at our church. But you really do have to like almost pick a day and be like, listen, we're gonna go off site. We're gonna like really dedicate this day to writing. Mm -hmm. You know, don't bring your phones. You know, don't be checking email or whatever. Yeah. Like this is not a planning center day. This is not a uh, <laughs> scheduling team member day. <laughs> you know, yeah, you have to really be intentional with it. Yeah, and it's been really cool. For a few of them, we've even like at the end of the day had a big song share. And so we've really made a full day of it. Like we just have a session in the morning, lunch session in the afternoon, and then a song share at the end. Yep. And they end up being really special. Even, I mean, there's been writing days where not a single song has been sung in our church, but I still cherish, we still all cherish those days because it was, 
such a special day of just communing with the Lord. Yeah, that's awesome. So what do you do with the song? Do people like do a scratch recording and then send it to you and then you kind of organize and sort through them later? Or who, how, so what happens to all thing, those songs that get written? Yeah, so what, one thing we, we kind of have is we, we call it the work tape culture because it's it can be really easy as you're writing a song if you like produce it up. A lot of times production can can mask a okay song. While, you know, if you have a song that the lyrics and the melody are just really stand out, if it's just on an acoustic guitar or piano, yeah. you know. And so at the end of the day, we all we send in all the work tapes to our worship director. And then he sends a link out to all of us. And we just kind of, we have a big group text where we talk about what songs resonated with us. And then eventually when we start kind of thinking through like, okay, this would be a good song to introduce on a Sunday. Then we go and we demo it out, get all the parts ready for Planning Center and chart it out for our team. Okay, got it. So then you yeah. identify songs that maybe you could actually play at church on Sunday morning. And then yeah. once you've identified it, then you kind of create the arrangement. Like how's the band actually going to play yeah. this? Yeah, and so mo okay. I would say over half of our songs, we, um, we've we kind of moved, we, it's kind of shifted over time. We've kind of figured out what works and what doesn't, but we've landed on usually doing the song on Sunday and we've had songs evolve over time by just doing them on Sunday and and seeing how the team re responds, seeing how people respond to it, making adjustments and yeah. And it just it ends up feeling a lot more natural and like birthed out of the church. But it's always fun when you know you play a song and everyone's like what what's that new song we're going to hear? It's like nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. Yeah. You have to bootleg it on your phone, yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I and you can really tell very quickly what songs are going to work or not. I feel like when you when you try oh, a new yeah. song at church, like you can kind of quickly kind of see and sense like this is gonna this is gonna work, or uh, yeah. something needs to be worked on this one. Yeah, no, nothing's worse, and this has happened to us. Nothing's worse than like getting a song that you're super hyped about, producing it, like everything, it's ready to go. Then you do it on a Sunday, and it's kind of like, eh. yeah, right. And so we we've, we've the last few songs that have really resonated with our church. I mean, we would do them for months before we ever even recorded them. So what is the first? What are the first steps a church needs to take if they're like, hey, like some worship leaders watching this and they're like wanting to like their dream is like, oh man, one day yeah. we want to produce like a five song EP for our church mm -hmm. of original songs. Like, what's the first step they need to take? I mean, I write just a ton of songs. I mean, we we've released as a church probably. 10 or 11 songs across two EPs and a few singles. Yeah. And we have a, we have a, a song space folder of over a hundred songs. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I mean, out of those writing days, sometimes we have over a dozen songs and we've done, and sometimes only one song makes it to a Sunday. Yeah. And so I would just say, write, 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 write. Yeah. Uh, and write and write again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It, and I would say, and then once you get to a spot, start, I mean, not only write your songs, but sing your songs at church. Um, because if you just write them, record them, and release them, it's, I mean, it, it does benefit your church, but there's something about singing them together as a church yeah. and really like making them part of your own church. So let's get a little technical or practical yeah. here on like, what, once you've written the songs and you've identified these are like the five songs we want to do, <laughs> what is the process? What are the steps? To like, if you're gonna take us from step one to the end of like a finished five yeah. song EP, like what are like the main steps to get there? Well, and the, this is, I, I don't want me to like not answer your question, but there's kind of two ways to do it. Yeah. So if you're doing like just a traditional studio recording, um, usually our steps are we, we demo the song for Sunday, play the song on Sunday, figure it all out. Well, a lot of times, um, have tons of like versions from it from Sunday. And then once we have it, we've landed on actually, this is how we want to do it. Then we just go the traditional route of you go into a studio, track drums, layer all the parts or traditional studio session. Yeah. On the other side, and this is what we started doing is as part of our nights of worship, we, uh, we use Dante for everything at our church. Um, and so it makes recording into logic really easy. And so what we end up doing is we multi-track the entire, the entire service. We multi-track rehearsal, um, we multi-track the run through. So we have multiple options from that. We, we mic the, uh, the room and then from that multi-track, we'll pull the multi-track in, um, in from logic 
go through everything and the last couple of recordings, I mean, the the song we just did only name, we kept some of the live guitars, all the live bass, all the live drums, and all the live vocals, um, and only had to overdub a few things. But that's where you go through and you you start from the what you've done on Sunday or on a night of worship, recorded into Logic, and then you can go through and kind of build from there because it's been a long time since like a live record is truly live. Yeah, like right. you listen to like the old like Hill song like Mighty to Save, and it's obvious that's from live. And now, I mean, it's layers on layers on layers on layers. Yeah. What do you prefer? And so, what 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 what? Which which way do you think this is the best way to go? If you could do it, honestly, it just depends on what you're you're wanting to achieve. Yeah. Um, because there's something about it. Because if you're trying with a studio recording. You can do a lot of really creative production elements that just don't translate live, and and don't really feel live. Like I mean, you look listen to a Hillsong United record versus a Hillsong Worship record, and they just feel different. But if you're wanting to capture that live congregational, I mean, I love live yeah. recordings. That seems like it's the hardest thing to capture is the crowd, like mm -hmm. like for oh, a yeah. usable track. You know, because a lot of times you end up getting like a ton of bleed from like the mm -hmm. drums are too loud, or you get that one person in the front you row who like is singing completely out of pitch it's yeah like, i feel like it's hard we, to capture a good usable crowd tick yeah and we what we we've, we've done and i mean there's no shame in saying this we definitely we have we keep the crowd in there uh, but we definitely have overdubbed uh the, you get a big group of people from your team together yeah. and overdub group vocals which is a blast it's so fun to get like 40 people from your team in a room and just sing yeah that, those are some of my favorite memories almost like a night of worship yeah, when I've done out a live album before, that those are my favorite memories of just doing the uh, the gang vocals they call them. You just get in a room, yeah. and have it's a pizza, super fun. And just get around and sing the songs. So, but it, I can't say like from a li like from a standpoint of tracking it live. Like for the the song we just released, only name, the singer actually had completely forgotten that we were recording that night, and it just made her like live vocal performance that much more passionate. Wow, yeah. And worshipful. Yeah. And because you could tell she wasn't singing to perform, she was singing to worship. Yeah. And we ended up keeping that entire vocal take because it was just, it fit that moment so well. That honestly just made me think of a story real quick. When I was doing a live album, I was recording a live album in Indianapolis probably like five years ago. And about 10 minutes before the whole thing was just to start, like this live recording with like 3,000 college students there, someone tells me, like, hey, there's like, uh, like there's a cop like putting a ticket or something on your car or... honestly i can't remember exactly the exact detail but there was some sort of emergency with my car in the parking lot and oh so i gosh. like i ran out there real fast to take care of it i actually cannot remember what it was yeah but it was such a frenzy that by the time i ran back mm -hmm. in to make sure the countdown you know like i run up on stage like 10 seconds left and lead the set i got i got through like 20 25 minutes of the whole set before i actually remembered oh <laughs> We're recording. <laughs> yeah. This is the live recording. And it actually was really, really great because I was not nervous at all. I was just doing yeah, what I do. I was not head, thinking yeah. about recording at all. And that is kind of the best scenario. So maybe the next time you guys do a live recording, you, I should like have a cop come like start towing your cars or something. Please yeah, don't no. do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, but even like in like just, but if you have to overdub, like yeah. one thing, it's just some, I, I heard and I'm not, I've heard through the grapevines, so don't quote me on this, that there's literally at elevation each, there's like a camera on each person. So if they have to overdub, it can be like, they can do it exact yeah. how, how it is. But for us, we one of our songs, I overdubbed the performance, but I literally still had the actual, the one from the live and every single like, yeah, like type stuff, I had them overdubbed so it would feel, so we were essentially still capturing the emotion and the ad libs and everything yeah. from the night but it just had no horrible symbols coming because usually it's yeah. not a performance issue it's a mic bleed issue yeah and that's that's the biggest thing is use a drum cage yeah <laughs> i know i know everyone loves cage free drummers but that's probably my biggest production thing is yeah. use a drum cage use a drum shield because they bleed it, in every it'll, mic. it bleeds so bad yeah so, Andy, if a church is wanting to do this, like, 
give us an idea just like even financially like what does it even cost like a church if a church wanted to do like a five song original song ep that they can throw on spotify like are we talking like how, how what's the range of this if they just uh, just a normal church right yeah that's such a, a hard question because it all depends on I mean, if you have somebody in your church that can produce it, yeah, and is and I mean that that's it. I mean, or if you have like a Dante set up, yeah, it's I mean the equipment saves so much money going into a studio. I mean, we've when we rent studios here in Nashville to track drums, we've been able to get deals that are like three five hundred dollars a day, yeah, which is great. Um, and so that's what you're usually looking three five hundred eight hundred dollars a day, depending on the studio, yeah, and and that's I mean. To, for a day of drums, if your drummer's ready to go, you can track drums for five songs in a day if they're absolutely ready to go with the parts. Um, but if like if you're using a digital board with Dante and DeLogic, yeah, then you can track all of it, you know, live at your church, and you can do it that way and save a ton of money. You have not have to go into a studio, yeah. use your volunteers and the team, and then it. I mean, if you especially if you have a uh, a, like a really solid producer in house, and then you just send it off to get mixed. You know, you can get a song mixed, hundred fifty to five hundred dollars, depending on the level of the mix engineer you're using. Yeah. Um, then that's what I would recommend at least. How does someone using find a, a certain, producer? I mean, for your city, it just depends. I would. I, I I'm bad at answering this question because I've already, I've always been the producer. Well, do they do they need to be in yeah. your city though? No, not necessarily. I mean, I've worked with. There's this one church I worked with, um, and they're, they're. It's like a church collective called Summit Road, and what they did is they they would track they track stuff at their church. They would send me the raw tracks that they that because I was sort of pseudo producing it and mixing it, and so it was this kind of co production setup. And I would get the tracks, give them feedback, say, hey, these parts here, I'd love if you retract those. This sounds great. And then it was this collaborative back and forth, even though they were in Kansas City and I was in Nashville. And so, we, and then once it was, and then I edited the stuff and it was just, it was this great back and forth process. So, I mean, there are producers that can work remotely, especially if you have an engineer locally at your church that can record stuff. Interesting, yeah. So, um, how have you seen your church impacted by you guys releasing your own music? Like, has it changed? How has it kind of impacted the culture there? It's been really, it's been really cool because it's been one. This, in particular, one song we have the name has just really like the bridge. Um, the song's about like we have the name of Jesus can overcome addiction, depression, all all these things. It listed all these different things in the bridge of the song, and so many people have found freedom just from that song. That was one of those songs where it's like we, the I, I wasn't part of the right, but they were they were writing it and saying like. They were just thinking about specific people in our church that they wanted to sing that over. Yeah. And so that's resonated really well, but just, it's been really cool to see how it's like how people in our church are able to, to share, to share the music as a missions opportunity mm. saying like our church released this. You should check this out. You should listen to this. And it, br it brings such a blessing to so many different people. It's not just reaching people like in our church, but outside of our church as well. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I've got a question for you as a songwriter, like, and you've, you know, you've done a lot of these loop worship songs for us where you, mm -hmm. you know, we bring you like a rough recording and you then take it and actually make it into something that could be played mm -hmm. on Spotify. Um, what's like the biggest thing you've seen is you've like been producing music for people that it's like, if they did this, it would make what you do a lot easier. <laughs> you know, like, so like I'm writing a song and I record a scratch, you know, of mm -hmm. it on a phone. Like, is there anything that you're like, man, this would, you know, they need to work way more on the arrangement, or they need to work on the lyrics yeah. more, or, like, is there something that you find is lacking that, like, could have made the process a lot better and the song product, the outcome a lot better in the end? One thing I've seen, especially with beginning songwriters, I remember back in college working with some songwriters, and they were so focused on coming up with cool chord progressions or cool chord inversions, and obviously, that stuff is pretty and that stuff is nice but revelation song is the same four chords the entire song right reckless love is i think at one point it's it changes a little bit but it's the same chords the whole so there's so many great yeah. songs. how he loves there's so many great songs that are the same chord progressions the entire time 
And so I think make, making sure that your melody is the strong, like I would say just melody all day because that's what, that's what makes the word sticky is the melody. And yeah. so you can have the best words in the world and no, no one will remember a single thing because the melody is not good. And so, and, and that's where songs like can go further than even sermons. Like I can't name what our sermon at our church was about three weeks ago. I don't remember, but I could sing three dozen worship songs from memory. And so that's what's so powerful about songs and why like, so when you have a really, really good melody, then it makes the truths of the lyrics stick in your brain. And sometimes like you look at King of My Heart, like you are good, good, oh, you are good. Yeah, I, I knew someone that they went through a miscarriage and that night they were just singing and crying those, those lyrics over and over again, God, you are good, you're still good. And that's what their mind, that's what they gravitated to was that song. And even though such simple lyrics, they were able to remember them and sing them because the melody is so good. Yeah. So I think focusing always first on the melody, then the lyrics, then the music, because you can always re- you can always reharmonize a great melody, but you can have the coolest chord progression, but if the melody stinks, no one cares. Yeah. Honestly, that you just uh, encouraged me because I feel like my personal songwriting superpower, I think, is melody and lyrics are what I really struggle with. (laughs) Yeah. So um, that definitely uh, gave me a little bit of hope. I appreciate that, Andy. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I, but it is kind of a both and. Like you do need to like. Oh, one hundred percent. You're saying focus on melody, but then you but then focus on lyrics. And then focus on lyrics. And I hate to say that music music is secondary because there are. There's there's riffs that immediately get stuck in your head. Yeah. But there but those are also attached to fantastic songs. Yeah. You know, and so right. no one no one plays a song because the riff is cool. Yeah, right. Like they just you're not going to lead a song because a riff is cool. I have one last bonus question for you and then Go we'll for wrap it. this up. And this was not on uh, the prepared list of questions, but <laughs> um singing original songs in church. So, mm-hmm. you know, the whole idea of like, I'm, and I'm gonna play devil's advocate on you on you a little bit, but like the whole idea of, you know, gathering together for worship at church is to like sing together. And like, mm-hmm. that kind of helps when people know the song and they're familiar with it. They've heard it before a million times, mm-hmm. which is why, you know, songs like Cornerstone always just crush every time I feel like. I mean, it's oh, like yeah. an amazing song and people know I mean, it. We're, and, we're playing this camp and we're doing Glorious Day like six times and the kids love it. Yeah, right, exactly. So what's hard is like, you know, are there some downsides of like churches playing their own original songs? Because it's mm-hmm. possible your original songs are not as good as like Glorious Day or Cornerstone. Yeah, and so I remember I was at Inside Elevation Conference and I went to the, the writing workshop with uh, Stephen Furtick and Chris Brown, which was amazing. They're both amazing songwriters. And something that, that Stephen Furtick said that I really appreciated was he said, like write then this goes back to writing a ton of songs he says we don't throw a song up there when when he's like we're not going to play our crappy song when we can put what a beautiful name instead like that's what he said and he's like yeah. which is funny coming from yeah. elevation but with that mindset of like we're only going to sing the songs on sunday if it feels like it works with the other songs we're not just go up there and sing an original song because it's an original song. It has to be a song that really stands up to, and it doesn't, I mean, yeah. What a Beautiful Name has like one of the greatest preachers of all time. It's, it's hard to beat that. But yeah. you can, but you, it, you, it has to feel natural where it, you don't want your average congregation to be like, oh, what's that? You know, you want it to feel like it flows in the set that still works with your worship flow. You don't want to just force an original song in and the way we look at it too is, I mean, we a lot of times we'll introduce songs a month after they've come out, but and in the same way, a lot of people in the church don't listen to worship music except what's on Sunday morning. And so you almost look at it the same way of like, if we're going to introduce a song, we'll do it, you know, two weeks on, then we'll take a break and do another week, and then put it in the regular rotation. And so people learn it just like any other worship song they would learn on a Sunday. 
Yeah. You just treat it like another song. It just doesn't happen to be on Spotify. Right. And I guess that's where so you have to you have real yeah. – that's where you have to have real self-awareness of like does this song really fit? Mm-hmm. Like does this kind of measure up to a song that we would want to do on Sunday morning? Because yeah, it's hard. You can get too. attached to your own songs. Oh, yeah. And the bigger the bigger collective of people writing helps that. I mean, just listening to music, having really good taste in music helps that too. Yeah. I mean, you're not like you're not trying to compare, and it, it's very humbling. But like, you're not trying to compare your songs to somebody down the street or even to the other songs. You're trying to compare your songs to "What a Beautiful Name," to "Reckless yeah. Love," to the those tent pole songs. Right. And then that changes everything. And then you're like, wow. I really need to step up my game or, and so that's, and then that's finding trusted people. And again, even finding a producer or other people you trust in the music industry or other worship leaders. I mean, we should all be learning from other worship leaders. If you don't have a two dozen worship leader friends, then get two dozen worship leader friends at different churches. Just say like, Hey, we're thinking about doing this song. Tell me if it sucks. (laughs) Yeah. That's and, so get, and, and having people that can give you that honest feedback because you don't want to end up like some of those people that end up on American Idol that their mama told them they could sing and there they are making a fool of themselves. Yeah, and we, right. don't, we don't want to be doing that. We want to be bringing our best, our best to our congregations. Right. Would you guys ever do a set that's all original? We've done them almost by accident before. But it was, but at that point, like the songs were, they've been released for a year. They're songs that our congregation knew just as well as any other song. Yeah. And so, and that's the thing is when you start treating your songs like their other big songs in rotation, and we, we, we do songs and we, we kind of, we, we do our song rotation as if no one in our church listens to Christian music. That's how we kind of look at it. Like, no one's listening to Christian radio, no one's listening to Christian music. So we make sure we throw some hymns in. We throw, we play Cornerstone. We play this, you know, we, we bring back songs we've been doing for five years once in a while. So the people in our church really know them. Yeah. And we probably only have about 25 songs in active rotation at most. Okay. At any given time. And so that way, so we can treat our original songs just like that as well. So even though they're not listened to them on Christian radio, the, we do them enough that they're familiar for our church. Yeah. And there does have to be some sort of like happy balance between, you know, because you do want to be able to play the original songs at your church. But I've also attended a church where like, like I, I attended a church recently. It was my first time going and they played all of their own original music and I had never heard mm-hmm. any song before. And honestly, yeah. the songs were not that great. And I was, just, and yeah, I was and that, sitting there thinking yeah. like, come on, man, you could have just played Glorious Day and like. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. Well, but, and that's, and, and again, it's all about your context. Like once you, like, especially once you've started releasing the songs and the songs are out, it's okay to like do yeah. that. But like, I mean, we're here at this camp and we're doing one original song and the rest are like songs that every, every kid knows. We're doing yeah. big tent pole worship songs so then they can really engage in worship. Yep. Yeah, right. And so, and that's the thing. A lot of times when we do like, if we have a Sunday where we do two original songs, we're also throwing in a cornerstone or yeah. a, what a beautiful name or something like that, that everyone's going to know no matter what. Yeah. Right. That's good, man. Well, Andy, thanks so much for joining us on this uh, conversation. I learned a lot. I'm sure other people did too. Where, uh, if people wanted to find you or your music or your church's music, where do they go? Yeah. So to, if you want to follow me and also I love helping, if you want, if your church wants to record anything, um, I can help you walk, walk through that process, remote production, mixing, anything like that. Um, so find me just Andy Blake Walker on Instagram is the easiest way to find me. And then the, my church is the bridge church. And so bridge worship is, uh, where all of our music is. And we just released a few, uh, a few songs in the last couple months that we're really proud of. That's awesome, man. All right. Good to, good to see you again, man. Thanks so much. Always good to talk with you. Yep. Talk to you later. Have a good time at camp. Thanks, man. Bye. Yep. Bye.